So when thinking about race, one of the things that we consider is discrimination, or discriminatory processes. Um, in a previous lecture, we talked about race and um, stereotypes and prejudices. And now I want to think a little bit more about the um, patterns of discrimination. My earlier examples primarily drew upon thinking about race relative to individuals and individual interactions. And in this lecture, in the focus on discrimination, I want to focus a little bit on how it is that organizations or institutions produce racism. So what is sometimes referred to as institutional racism or organizational racism. And this helps us see how it is that racism works, not just on the individual level, but on the organizational level or thought of differently, how it doesn't just require a group of individuals to be explicitly biased against others in order to produce racism or um, uh, uh, ethnic discrimination, but instead, um, sometimes the very structure of a society helps reproduce patterns of racism through forms of discrimination. So um, today, we're going to sort of pivot our understanding a little bit away from the interpersonal and the psychological, more towards something akin to um, a, a discrimination of the organizational and the institution. And, you know, racism and individuals and institutions is an important dimension in part because it points to how it is that um, you can have what Eduardo Mia Silva, um, a sociologist, has called racism without racists or how it is that there can be the existence of racism within a society without a group of people who explicitly self-identify as racist or who have open, explicit biases that they simply affirm and say, I'm sorry, I have a bias, or actually, I have a bias against um, uh, Asians, but I'm not sorry. I'm perfectly happy with my explicit bias. So that form of racism without racist, as Bonilla Selma articulates, is to think about racism not just as happening within individuals, but also within institutions. And there are multiple examples that I'd like to draw upon today to explain how it is that race could be institutionalized so that racism serves not just as one bad actor doing bad things, but instead is built into the fabric of structure of society. Now, the most obvious example of institutionalized racism in the United States is slavery and how it is that slavery was built into the, literally into the Constitution of the United States. Um, and what we mean by um, the institutionalization of slavery are a series of compromises that were made in the formation of the Constitution that thought about race in a very specific way. Um, so I'm going to give two, I'm actually going to give three examples of the institutionalization, actually four examples of the institutionalization of racism today so that you can begin to see what it means to think about race as something that is institutionalized. One will be from the U.S. Constitution. Um, another will be from a range of important legislations like Social Security um, and the GI Bill. Um, a third uh, will be to think about um, uh, something like red line, um, which will become very important when we get to urban um, sociology um, and patterns of inequality in the United States in particular, but we'll see it in other places as well. So what do we mean by slavery was built into the Constitution of the United States? Well, what I mean is that slavery um, um, is tied in part to this idea of a three-fifths compromise. So some of you um, uh, may know this, that, um, uh, that the slaveholding states did not want their slaves to be thought of as, or to be legally allowed to vote. And what this meant was that um, the Northerners then argued, um, the Northern, um, particularly the Northern slaves, states that didn't have slaves, said, well, if your slaves can't vote, they're not really people. And given that representation in Congress is determined by the number of people in a region, we shouldn't count the slaves. So the slaves aren't really people, they're property. And since they're not really people, but property, they shouldn't be counted. Now, this was in part a deeply racist argument on the part of the Northerners, but it was also a politically 
um, uh, advantageous one to them because it would mean that Northerners got greater representation overall. And in some ways, they were saying to the Southerners, if you're not going to count them, you're not going to treat them as equal people. They don't get to be counted towards representation. The Southerners, of course, objected to this and wanted their slaves to be counted even if they weren't going to be represented. And so there was this large argument and the solution was to count slaves as three-fifths of a person. So the three-fifths compromise was a compromise between the North and the South. The North who said, if slaves don't, aren't, aren't, are considered property, then they're not really people and you shouldn't count towards the number of representatives that you have. And the Southerners who said, they absolutely should count towards our representatives. The solution was the three-fifths compromise where slaves counted as three-fifths of a person. This was formalized into the Constitution. And this was a way in which slavery became institutionalized. It became formalized in legal documents in ways in which Americans understood their political system. There were other things that happened in order to consecrate slavery, and in particular, race tied to slavery within the American South during the slave period. Perhaps um, the most important were, was the conceptualization of who it was that could be a slave. Of critical importance here was the Europeans ceasing with the transatlantic slave trade. So when the Europeans stopped trading slaves, that is, um, uh, taking captured Africans from um, uh, the west coast of Africa and sailing them across the ocean, to um, the Caribbean, to South America, and to North America to sell them at slave markets. When they stopped doing that, South Americans, the, America, the you know, Southern United States faced a critical problem, which was where is their labor supply going to come from? Where are they going to be able to find people to work for them or to continue as slaves? And a solution that they fashioned sort of pragmatic solution that they came up with was that all the children of slaves were slaves. And this was not just a solution relative to the category of slave, but it was a solution relative to the category of race. And this is what I, we mean when we talk about how institutions are deeply involved in race making. So the solution looks something like this. There is an immutable characteristic, an unchangeable characteristic among African Americans or Black people, or as they thought of in the time in the South, Negroes, and that such Negroes could not change, or that there was something permanent about them that was transferred from parent to child, to parent to child, to parent to child. Now, in some ways, this was just a practical solution to a labor problem in the American South, a practical solution which sought to continue to have the constant supply of slaves to the South. But in other ways, it drew upon a racial conceptualization of race. So it's a combination of this practical economic problem and a scientific understanding of race that begins to be mobilized and justified to say, these people are always this kind of person. There's something deep inside them it sort of determines their blackness. And so there's sometimes this idea of a one drop rule or that sort of one drop of African blood makes you black in the United States. And part of the foundation of that rule, of the immutability of race, about how race is a permanent, unchanging thing, was partially to help solve the challenge of a labor problem in the South. In a sense, race is institutionalized in scientific knowledge, and science played a critical role in the institutionalization of race as a permanent thing. And, and all kinds of economic and political actors used science strategically and opportunistically in order to produce knowledge about race. They created an institutional scientific understanding of race as something that couldn't be changed, something that you fundamentally are. And we should read the science of race, that experience of the science of race as something unchangeable, 
permanent and absolute in terms of human differences is emerging in part, not solely, but in part out of that moment. Racism was also built into schools, into public agencies, and into private establishments in the United States. So schools were segregated, and segregated schools meant that different children went to different kinds of schools. Now, race isn't the only ways in which schools are segregated. Schools are often segregated on a wide range of ways, but the segregation of schools led to concentration of um, races, which also supported the view that these two groups were very different from one another. In socially isolating blacks from whites, primarily in the United States, what it helped to do was solidify and even justify the immutable differences between those groups. It was also built into many of the nation's most important pieces of legislation, so that during the Woodrow Wilson administration, and even later under Johnson and the Great Society, um, uh, I mean, sorry, not Johnson and the Great Society, but under um, Frederick, uh, 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 Franklin Delano Roosevelt, major pieces of legislation explicitly excluded Black Americans from benefits. So, so from Social Security to the GI Bill, Social Security is a, a, an American program that helps support people after they retire. So it gives them income after retirement um, uh, that they can live upon. Um, and it's something that as a wage worker, you pay into Social Security. And then as you retire, you are able to you receive Social Security. Um, and this was a social program that was helped to alleviate elder poverty. As people began to age, um, they often were extremely poor. And this helped moderate that poverty. The GI Bill was a bill that allowed for um, people who served in the military to receive free education support for their educational attainment. And in the GI Bill, Blacks were excluded from parts of the GI Bill, sometimes from all of, uh, parts of, of, of the GI Bill, but eventually parts of the GI Bill. In this sense, race became institutionalized because race was the basis upon which different government programs allotted opportunities. Maybe one of the most important, and here I will stand by that statement. It's a phrase I've used a few times, but this time I really will stand by it. Um, ways in which race was institutionalized was through redlining. Redlining, we'll talk a lot more about when we get into urban sociology, was a policy where people who lived within particular areas of a city would not receive federal insurance for loans that were granted to them. So there was a series of policies in the United States that said, you know, one of the things that the government has to do in order to support economic development and the development of family wealth is to insure loans. So when a bank gives a family a loan or gives a business a loan, or gives a person a loan, that loan can be insured by the federal government so that if the person defaults on the loan, the risk is lower to the bank. The idea of this program was to create incentives for economic development and incentives for families to create wealth, primarily through owning households. And so, in so far as loans were insured, it became cheaper to give loans because banks took on less risk when they actually gave out loans. But there were certain red lines drawn around particular neighborhoods, which um, said that the federal government would not insure the, line, the loans within those neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods tended to be overwhelmingly Black. Now, what this means is that there was institutional racism, that Blacks were explicitly excluded from federal programs, which helped reduce the cost of loans, so that white Americans had far greater access to loans, which provided them with the capacity to start businesses and build wealth. And we still see the effects of this today, where there are huge differences in wealth between Black and white Americans, but that those differences are in wealth primarily driven by household wealth. And that that household wealth has as one of its origins the, way, the, the fact that the federal government insured the loans of white neighborhoods and refused to insure the loans of black neighborhoods. This is an example of how racism became instant 
institutionalized in American ways. It became not just the product of a set of, um, you know, uh, uh, decisions by individuals, but it was codified in law. And um, other examples of this that you might think about are uh, the ways in which different racial, um, um, uh, different kinds of drugs had different uh, punishments associated with them. So huge differences in the punishments for crack cocaine versus um, cocaine, powdered cocaine, that people would snort. And why were there huge differences in the punishments between them? Not because the drugs were more dangerous, but because crack was primarily used by Black Americans and powdered cocaine was primarily used by white Americans. And so in federal and state policies, you see much different sets of punishments depending upon who's likely to use that kind of drug. Drugs that Black Americans are more likely to, to use are typically subject to higher punishments. This is an example of institutionalized or organized racism. Certain those decisions, from my perspective, are the result of an individual decision of racism. That is, that there were a series of political actors and economic actors that made discriminatory decisions about Black Americans. But afterwards, after those initial decisions were made, they became institutionalized. They became part of the social structure itself, part of the laws, part of the ways in which society was organized. And that had subsequent really important impacts on continuing to reproduce racial inequalities. Now, affirmative action is um, one policy that seeks to mitigate, moderate, or transform um, some of the previous institutional inequalities that existed. And so affirmative actions are policies or programs that seek to rectify past discrimination through active measures to ensure equal opportunity. Affirmative action doesn't just apply to race. It also applies to gender. It could apply to class. And it could be, it's a policy that says, we recognize that there are previous inequalities and we're going to take positive action to try and rectify this. In other words, affirmative action policies explicitly acknowledge unjust policies and decisions that have historically limited the opportunities of a disadvantaged group and benefited an advantage group. And they take steps to try and make up for such injustice. So we might ask, what would an affirmative action policy look like in order to address redlining or the ways in which um, uh, uh, Black um, uh, Americans did not have businesses or homes insured? And one such affirmative action program is to give higher competitive eligibility to federal public works programs among Black-owned businesses so that Black-owned businesses may have um, a preference in, in terms of whether or not they're um, um, uh, um, hired by federal government. There are also affirmative action programs relative potentially to gender or to sexuality or to class. Any kind of policy that explicitly acknowledges failure of the justice of uh, failure for systems to produce equality in previous instances and seeks to rectify that is would be considered an affirmative action program. It's often used to to encourage or even require organizations like universities and public agencies to consider factors like race in making decisions about which contractors to use, which candidate to hire for a position, or which student applicant to admit. And in general, the policies look like this, that the guidance says all other things being equal, that is, if all other dimensions of the decision are the same, you should give the opportunity for, to someone from a previously disadvantaged group. Because previously, more advantaged groups were systematically given far greater um, um, uh, uh, um, opportunities, and we need to moderate those. Now, part of the vision behind affirmative action is the idea of cumulative advantage, where the advantages aren't just something that you experience once. Instead, there are things that accumulate over the life course and even in over generations, so that two candidates can look very different from one another not because of their actions, but because of cumulative advantages over the course of their lifetimes or over the course of their families' lifetimes. 
So um, uh, uh, what this means is that like, if you give a little bit to somebody now, the chances that they can use that to get a little bit more and that, that they can use that to get even a little bit more and that they can get that to get even a little bit more is high. So that small disadvantages tend to accumulate over time. And one of the ways to deal with that or moderate those cumulative advantages is through some form of an affirmative action program that seeks to give advantages to others so that they can accrue advantages in the ways in which other groups have as well. Um, affirmative action tends to be a highly contentious policy, particularly in school. Um, so uh, affirmative action within schools is something that's the source of a huge number of fights within school literature. Um, and I will say that like, there are all kinds of decisions that institutions make, schools in particular, about how to bring people in and who to give opportunities to. And that those decisions about who to give opportunities to typically have some bias in them. So my favorite example is the largest sort of bias program is in the Ivy League, um, uh, primarily, but in a lot of private schools, what you find is that those schools have equal numbers of women and men in their institutions. Yet women tend to far outperform men in high school and even in terms of college qualifications, college qualifications. So one question we might ask is, why if women outperform men in terms of their high school qualifications, why is it that they make up only half of college students? The first answer is that they don't. Actually, today, and we'll talk about this a lot more in the education lectures, women make up far more than half of overall college students. But that's partially because in many colleges and universities, they cannot use gender as one of the ways in which they make decisions. So they simply have to decide on who to accept overall. They, they, they can't look at the gender balance of the institution um, to do so and be discriminatory. But in other institutions, like in elite private schools, they often instruct classes that are explicitly 50-50 in their gender um, uh, composition, um, which is to think in very gender binary ways as if there's only two genders, but still keep that aside for now. They're almost always 50-50 in their gender composition. Why? Because men get preference in college admission. Less qualified men are admitted because schools think it's important to have a college composition that is 50-50. Now that view of the importance of a 50-50 college composition, you know, it's partially an assumption of heterosexuality um, where you know, what you're doing in school is providing an opportunity for people to partner um, through those partnerships. Like you, know, you assume that everybody is heterosexual, but it's also the view that it's valuable to have a balance of people within an organization. And I want you to ask yourself, what are the sets of things that you think are valuable balances within organizations, or what are the ones that you think are not? What are the sets of social policies that you think of as a big problem? Do you think it's a big problem that private colleges and universities and public colleges that have, are allowed to consider gender and construct classes that are 50-50 in their composition? Or do you think that that's not how we should make decisions? Some of this is a question of prejudice and discrimination. Other parts of it though is to ask what kinds of communities do we want? And why would we want that kind of community? To return this to a discussion of race, one of the questions we might ask ourselves is, what kinds of racial communities do we want? Do we want racial communities of segregation? Or, by contrast, do we want racial communities of diversity? And what are the benefits to that diversity if we think that such diversity is desirable? For now, I'll suggest that there's some research um, that shows that diversity can be beneficial to groups, that groups make better decisions under conditions of diversity, and so that it's important to have some preference for organizations and institutions that are racially and ethnically diverse. But very importantly, diverse groups tend to be more contentious. And what that means is that diverse groups 
tend to have higher degrees of contention or higher degrees of um, uh, tension and infighting because of the differences that they represent. In this way, diversity is both beneficial but difficult to maintain, but perhaps it should be a value. And one of the things that I'd like you to ask yourselves now at the end of this lecture is what are the sets of things that you value within an organization? Do you think it's valuable to have diversity um, in terms of class, race, gender? And if so, why? What are the benefits of that sort of thing? And if you don't think that these are things that we should value at all, why not? And what are the alternate things that you think we should value?